Welcome back to the Future in Review podcast. I'm here today with Future in Review 2024 speaker Namish Patel. Namish is a founder and investor in early stage digital health startups. He is the president of the healthcare practice at Red Cell Partners, and he'll be speaking at this year's Future in Review conference, which is coming up October 20th to 23rd at the Terranea Resort in Los Angeles. Namish, welcome to the podcast. It's great to have great. you here. Thanks for having me. So you have an interesting background in your role, especially because you actually helped get Red Cell off the ground. And it's a really unusual fund in both its purpose and its structure. So I'm hoping that you can start off by giving us a little bit of your personal backstory. So how did you come to be in your current position? What were you doing before this? And, and what was the formation of this fund? Sure. Um, I got my start at a company called um, Rally Health, which we um, built and sold uh, to United Health Group. So we were eventually acquired by Optum. And then after that, spent some time at, at Optum in, in various roles uh, within, within Rally. And um, really through that experience, I spent a lot of time with employers, payers, providers, and so really got a broad look at the larger healthcare ecosystem, as well as a lot of experience in, in looking at different types of products. And, and really the lens that we, we came in from was really everything around consumer engagement in healthcare and how to make healthcare more accessible, um, easier to use, um, just more delightful for, for consumers, generally speaking. It, it's funny, though, because healthcare is already so delightful for consumers. <laughs> well, you're one of the very few people who would say that. Uh, but um, you know, gen generally speaking, if we, if we look back to even, um, you know, almost 15 years ago when that business started, um, at that time, um, you know, the idea of scheduling appointments online was a new thing. You know, it was way more facts than there is now. There's still right. a lot of facts out there. I think um, I think people also forget that until even really like during the pandemic, a lot of this, like healthcare has come a long way in the last couple of years even, right? There was yeah, so much about has. being virtual that forced some of that transition. Yeah, I mean, you know, telehealth companies were around, but they didn't have any real adoption. Um, most of the digital health at that time was a completely new category. Like there wasn't such thing as a, like digital health as a, as a term didn't exist. And um, really, like at that time, there weren't even really like VCs focused on the space. Like it, it wasn't something that anyone really looked at in a meaningful way. Um, and so we, we sort of grew up at a time when, when it was sort of before all, all this started to happen. And then as we grew the business, the markets evolved. And now I think we think of all healthcare as having some digital component. And I think, you know, a lot of, a lot of the changes in reimbursement, a lot of changes in consumer expectations, a lot of changes in the market generally sort of force every healthcare business to think of how they're going to use technology and digital capabilities to differentiate themselves or, or stay relevant. And I think generally that's a, that's a great thing. It's a, it's a win for consumers. It's going to make the healthcare experience better for everybody. So how did you get from there to Red Cell? What was the transition? So actually the, um, our founder at, at Rally, uh, Grant Verstandig is also the founder of Red Cell. And, you know, he was basically getting the band back together. <laughs> um, and so we were, or I was originally just going to help out with some growth work. And then as we were raising the fund, um, I started to actually work on uh, developing some of our new businesses. And um, most of our entire team were all really like early, early team members, founders of various different businesses. So uh, that's just sort of the DNA of our firm is you know, we are builders first. We're developing new businesses. We do the hard zero to one work. We come up with the crazy ideas that we try to make real. And that's, uh, that, that's what we're all about. And so um, we, we closed Red Cell at the end of last year, our first fund, um, and we really focus on healthcare and national security, and I lead the healthcare part of what we do. So Red Cell is a very unique structure. I mean, there, there are other, I would say, startup studios out there for sure, but why did you in particular choose to found companies and grow companies yourself internally rather than investing externally? So a, a few reasons. So the, the first thing is, yes, there are startup studios, but I wouldn't really categorize this as a startup studio in that we're not like a place where people are submitting their business plan to be in our next batch. So like it's, right. we're not really in like the YC or Techstars model. Um, and we're also not, um, you know, an incubator where we're constantly like recruiting founders to come and come and do that. Like now, you know, that is a key part of what we do. But many of what we do here is, much of what we do is growing businesses and ideas internally from scratch and then building the, the team. So really think of every red cell company as really a red cell build. And it's something that, you know, we're spending a lot of time to think about the market, 
to understand where the opportunity is to hire the right founders and put all of those pieces together. And that's a, that's a big part of what we, what we focus on generally. And so, so, um, what was the problem you mentioned, you know, healthcare and national security, that's a pretty unusual combination, I would say. Um, what was the problem that you set out to solve? with this fund? So really Red Cell has been created to solve our country's most pressing problems. And, you know, healthcare and national security make up a substantial part of our federal budget. Um, they are areas where we are, you know, generally not competitive from a cost perspective, even if we do have capability. And there's going to be a big change in both of those categories over the next few decades. And in both cases, you have very similar exit pathways. So in the same way that you have the primes on the defense side, you have your healthcare mega corporations like a United, a CVS, um, a Cigna and so forth. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, there's a lot of parallels to that. And also in the terms of like how you would build a company, the cost it takes to just get a business off the ground is also very similar. Um, the cycle times to getting signal from the market are longer in healthcare. The way that you build a company to exit is is very particular in healthcare and national security. And so those two businesses really follow a very similar template, but they ultimately, um, you know, we're in those things because we want to serve our, our larger interest, which is you know, we want to make, you know, our country more competitive and we want to bring solutions that are really meaningful to the market. It's interesting. I hadn't thought about the parallels between healthcare and national security, but you're right in that they both require a lot of investment, significant, you know, time, time to uh, product and time to market. Are there, how has that affected how Red Cell thinks about LPs? Like what is the breakdown of your LPs? Where are they, where's the funding coming from? So today, most of our um, investors are prominent family offices um, mm -hmm. who, who have, um, you know, just been a tremendous supporters of ours, you know, helping us start. I mean, we were a first fund and probably like the worst time ever to raise a first fund. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, I think our results have been great so far and, you know, we hope to keep doing this. Um, and so th that's a lot of our LP base. And then really like the, the focus in how we work with our LPs is, you know, they're, they're not just like passive capital, like our LPs are really involved and they've been extremely helpful in, in almost every single company we've ever done. And, um, generally speaking, the, you know, our model here is we want to be there on, you know, day one, first dollar in building these businesses. And mm -hmm. our model is, is that we build them internally because, there is a substantial amount of, um, you know, time and effort that has to go into getting a healthcare company going to get signal from the market. And really our entire platform and process is about, com is about compressing that time to market and compressing that, that uh, understanding of like what it takes to do go to market right in healthcare. You know, we don't fund companies that are then looking for product market fit. Like we generally know a lot of things up front. Um, you know, if you want to be in, in healthcare doing anything that's going to generate outcomes, you have to go build a product. You have to spend a year, another year selling the product. You have to spend another year getting your results. And then in year four, you know, you're ready to scale. And right. so we're taking that, that timeline and really compressing it down with what we do. And ultimately, you know, that's the strategic value we bring to our investors is, you know, we have some, you know, real value that we deliver for uh, the businesses and, and really make, give them an edge among, you know, anyone else who's, who's in a similar position. Okay, so I have a question for you, a follow-up question, which is normally in VC, there's this co concept of investability, right? Which basically means, does this company have the potential to scale enough to provide 10x or 100x or whatever it might be returns? How do you all think about that differently? Or how is that different for you when you're looking at potential companies? Sure, a, a few things. So, um, so let's start at like the top level of this. We invest in health services, care delivery, and what we broadly call therapeutic enablement. Every business that we have, we're usually using technology as our operating leverage of some kind. So there are companies that are pure tech and there's companies that are tech enabled services, but generally mm -hmm. there's some technology that is our operating leverage. We're then able to quantify the value of that operating leverage in terms of either, you know, really just basic business metrics, right? Like is your CAC better? Is your LTV higher? Um, are you, you know, driving the things that matters? Are your OPEX you know, decreasing because of the way that you're using technology? And so that's sort of like part one, right? Like, can you quantify and attribute the value you're creating to basically right. earn the right to compete in a new space? Mm -hmm. And then the second part of this is, you know, going to your question on investability is once I know those things, then how real is it to be able to build a business that can get to a hundred billion dollars of revenue? And that's ultimately what we look at, right? Like our, our goal here is to build businesses for exits. 
and you know not just for our in current investors but also investors in our businesses as they mature you know that's what our you know future plan is on every business we build is you know is this a hundred million dollar revenue opportunity and do we believe that that's achievable in a certain window with a certain amount of resources and if, if all those things are true you know that generally will like make the filtering of categories we want to explore and then you know based on those categories we'll then you know come up with ideas test things and and work through a process to bring a company um you know live into market so i want to come back to that idea of the process because i'm cu i'm very curious about what that entails but first before we go there let's talk about your healthcare thesis what is your investment thesis when it comes to healthcare what trends are you focused on or what spaces are you most interested so in? yeah there, there are a few points of this thesis. So the first out thing I would say is, you know, generally speaking, we believe like the, our demographics are our destiny. Like we are in a, we have a substantial aging population, right? 5% uh, of people drive 50% of the total cost of healthcare. And, um, you know, that spend is accelerating, not slowing as mm -hmm. a bulk of our population ages. And we just do not have the money to pay for all of that. Uh, the second is that, you know, we believe that healthcare is going to continue to be value seeking. So I think we've seen like phase one or two of value-based care, but you know, this is going to be a generational shift in the way that um, healthcare in this country works. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's going to create a number of opportunities to do things differently than they've been done before. And then the last point that I'd make is uh, digitization has finally come to healthcare. So, you know, we're sort of 10 plus years out from when all the EMRs were installed and adopted. And now mm -hmm. some of those silos are breaking down and now that data is being accessible. And at the same time, we believe that what COVID did was really greatly accelerate the consumer's um, willingness to use technology, to be comfortable with telehealth, to be comfortable with all these different connected devices. And so when you think about, you know, you've got a population of people that we basically have no money to pay for. We have this shift of value and we have a completely you know, new type of consumer who has different expectations. It really opens the door for businesses to exist today that previously wouldn't have existed. And then if you take those and then you kind of kind of magnify that by now, like, where is AI going to you know, create the most operating leverage uh, that gives you uh, a, a nice filter to look at. Right. And, and our general thesis is those are the major themes. And out of those themes, where can you build 100 million revenue businesses? And then out of those, which one of those businesses can you, you know, start and grow with a defensible moat? And generally speaking, that's our view of this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the high level thesis is that healthcare is large and only growing. And it's one of those things where we want to focus on problems that are common, costly and unavoidable. So, right. you know, we're not really in a lot of lifestyle businesses. That's not really what we do at our core. You know, we're in businesses where we feel like we are going to meaningfully move the needle in terms of in terms of healthcare and healthcare costs. So at Future Interview, we look a lot at patterns, right, which is what you've just described are these top three patterns that you all are tracking demographics, value-based care. Um, and, and I'm curious, can you for, and digitization, right? Electronic medical records and the like. Um, for those who are not maybe as familiar with the medical space, can you talk a little bit more about the transition? Like a lot of our audience, I think are in tech generally, may not be as familiar with healthcare. When you, the transition to value-based care, what does that mean? Like how will that transform the industry? So really simply, um, we used to be in a system where you got paid for what you did. So, mm -hmm. you know, if I run more tests, I do more surgeries, I make more money. And we're right. moving to a system where there's a set amount of money and we have to be able to get the most efficient outcome in that, in that number. And whatever the spread is, like that's where the profit is, right? So we're moving from where we just wanted to create as much volume at the highest possible price to one where it really is ultimately about the total value you create, right? What's the net outcome you've achieved? And that shift is going to change a lot about change a lot in terms of how we think about delivering care. And, and it's not just thinking about like, it, there's like the first order effects, which are, well, how does this affect what like an orthopedic surgeon does or, or something like that? But then you, you have to think about like, then how does that affect what the businesses that support those, those providers do as well, right? So when mm -hmm. you move to value, well, then so does everything else around you. And I think this is going to affect how we think about pharmaceuticals. It's going to think about how we think about devices. It's going to affect um, how providers operate. Also, how health services that serve them, right? There are going to be a whole new set of services that are valuable in ways that maybe services before this were, were not as valuable. And so that's a, it's, it's a whole shift in the, our mentality and the way we think about care. 
And it really, you know, as you think about what that means in value, it starts to really help us understand, you know, and really kind of move us to this world where we're going to incentivize prevention more than we have. You know, today we have a sick care system, not really a healthcare system. Um, because of the way we divide the risk dollars in this country, there is just a limit to the investments that are economically viable as it you know, relates to preventative care, which is why, you know, if you get sick, I think, you know, if I, if I got seriously ill, I would want to be seriously, you know, I have coverage and all, the, all those things. Like I'd want to be seriously ill in this country because we have all the best technology and all the best doctors. But at the same Until time, you know, it comes at an exorbitant price, right? Yeah. And so it's like one of those things where if you can afford it, the United States is the best place to be. But the problem is almost no one can afford it, right? Uh, and that's what that's the shift that's going to happen in, in value-based care is we've got to be able to bring those costs down. And, and one way to do that is to incentivize um, everyone in the system on the value they're creating, not just on the actions that they're performing. So let's talk about some of the companies that you've spun out on those themes. What, uh, like, what what are you all working on that you're excited about in those spaces? So to date in healthcare, we've built seven companies, and I can quickly mm -hmm. just like kind of run through what they are and, and give you an example of, of, of what they do. Um, the first company we built was a company called Zephyr AI, um, recently um, raised a, a large external amount of capital. And we're in the business of using AI and ML to support pharma in being able to um, drive label expansion and drug discovery. And we're specifically focused on oncology. So we're helping mm -hmm. pharma companies basically um, develop new drugs for cancer. And uh, the uniqueness we built in our AI is we have the ability to get exceptionally high predictive capacity from very small amounts of data. And um, you know that, that is what we, that's an example of what I would call therapeutic enablement. We're not the ones who are making the drugs, doing the trials, dealing with the FDA, but we are helping those companies that do um, get better outcomes. And right. if we are able to help a pharma company get something to trial in a more efficient way, able to help them choose better targets, we're saving them tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars and creating a large economic opportunity for them. And so that's what we, okay. we think about in that business. Um, another business that we've developed is a company called Taramind which is in the psychedelic assisted therapy space. So what's interesting about this is we didn't actually set out to build a psychedelic assisted therapy company. We set out to say there's a huge opportunity in behavioral health. Behavioral health costs are growing at this exponential rate, yet we're not seeing a, a, you know, much relief. Like today, like there's every kind of app for getting a therapist to you, right? It's right. online, it's in an AI, it's in person, it's in a network, it's not in a network. There's all these versions out there. Um, but we're not solving our like the root cause of some of these issues. And one of the things that we found is that, you know, starting with ketamine and some of these new psychedelic therapies that will come to market, we think the way we think about behavioral health will fundamentally change over the next decade. And we need to build the mechanism and, and the rails, if you will, to be able to do that in a way that is value seeking. So, you know, are you able to win on, on outcomes? Are you able to deliver consistent, high quality care? Can you measure all of that data? And that's what, what Taramine does. And they're focused on right now, large, employers, but eventually they'll move to the whole healthcare market. Um, and then going back to what we we're talking about and, you know, demographics being our destiny, um, we have two businesses focused on duels, uh, one that's called Savoy Life that focus on uh, senior living. And we work with senior living organizations to basically um, help them streamline their operations as it relates to clinical care. Like one of the issues that we are going to face is that as we dramatically grow the number of elderly folks in this country, their healthcare needs are going to increase at this like astronomical rate. So people right. today live Which longer, already, but they also live yeah. sicker. And what, what's, what that's hap what's happening there is the senior care facilities and like, you know, senior living areas are going from being what used to be a, some, you know, to make it really simple, a restaurant plus an apartment. And now it's turning into a restaurant plus apartment plus a low acuity hospital. And what's happening is because you have this massive demand, you have this real crunch on affordability, it's forcing people to live sicker in places that really are not equipped to deal with all of their healthcare needs. And we're providing those, those senior living operators um, a support system to be able to actually get access to providers and, and help their residents with their healthcare needs. And the downstream effect of that is if your residents are living longer, healthier lives with less complications, it's better margin improvement for you the operator, right? You're, you have less turnover in your beds. You have um, less costs of just managing transportation and everything else that goes along with managing healthcare costs. And that's ultimately the, the value we drive there. Um, and then we have another business focused on duels in Medicaid. 
and some that were in another another few businesses working on in therapeutic enablement. But at a high level, you sort of get a general theme for what we do is we're looking for these really big societal problems where the problem is something that is common, it's costly, it's unavoidable, where we know we can actually, in a, in a very quantified way, produce metrics um, that will drive a significant outcome. So I'm curious to, to follow up a little bit on something you said, which is you mentioned that you're focused on this problem, which is that we don't, that we don't have the funding essentially to provide medical care for, I mean, what's commonly referred to as the silver tsunami, right? Which is this boomer population that's coming up and is will is and will continue to be acceleratingly need additional care without necessarily having the cost. Um, are you focused at all on like what you're describing with Savoy? Is that correct? Yep, that's correct. That that seems like it would apply to a specific part of that population that already has the the financing to live in an assisted living facility. Can you talk a little bit more about Yeah. So our, our goal there is we when we scale that business, we, we start uh -huh. with facilities, but we eventually our goal is to scale that down into people living in their own private homes. You know, we know people want to age in place. They want to age in their homes, in their communities, around people they know. You know, that that is what we want to ultimately deliver. But when you just look at where the industry is today, like there's a ton of money from private equity going into home care. There's a huge shift to moving the hospital to the home mm -hmm. uh, to deal with this. But, you know, as those things happen, you know, there is just a certain barrier um, of cost that it's required to do that. So, you know, what happens today is, yes, we can send a doctor and a nurse to your house, but it's really only worth it if you have a certain level of acuity, right? You've been discharged because you've had some, you know, a major healthcare issue. You know, right. we're not going to send doctors and nurses to everyone's house for every house call for minor things. It doesn't make sense to do that. And so we have to find a way to basically make the math on prevention work so that we can lower costs over the long run. And today that's sort of what, what we're doing is saying, today everyone's focused, most models are focused on the, the immediate acute areas. But if we zoom out of where we will be in 10 years, there'll be ever more reimbursement and ever more incentive to get further and further up that risk curve to ultimately affect the total cost of care. And, and that's Got really it. what so we're you're doing. Basically so you're basically creating the infrastructure to be able to expand Savoy beyond in-home residential treatment centers. Yep, because... exactly. How, how can we get you the equivalent of assisted living for a fraction of the cost in your own home over time? Cool. Um, we are about out of time, but I wanted to ask you one last question, which is about the future of healthcare. What outside of, we've talked a lot about Red Cell and your investments internally, outside of that space, what healthcare innovations are you most interested in or excited about that are not a part of your investment portfolio? So um, I would say two. So the first one is everything happening in the GLP space. So all the new GLP um, drugs coming to market we think they represent an incredible opportunity to basically solve obesity in a major mm -hmm. way and make a big dent in the total cost of care and chronic diseases. Now, today it's not affordable to give everyone who wants that drug access to it, but we think over time that, you know, the, over a generation, I think we are gonna have done a lot to reduce the incidence of diabetes and, and all the things that are tied to metabolic syndrome. We think this is like a generational, you know, world-changing thing that's Transition. happening right now. We're on the very early stages of it. And we are right now, in fact, building a business in that very category, which we'll be able to talk about at some point in the future. Um, in addition to that, um, we also think AI is going to have a, a substantial impact. If you think, of, if you just zoom out in health services, um, there are lots of businesses that are very large, but are running on 25 year old plus legacy systems that have a ton mm -hmm. of manual processes. And as AI becomes more and more capable, um, we are going to be able to use that to actually drive a lot of outcome and efficiency in health services. So, you know, I think there are places where AI will be immediately useful in a clinical setting. There are places where it'll take time. But, you know, our focus right now, I think in the next five to 10 years, you know, any place where you could find these process improvements in, in AI, where you can kind of build a new competitor because you have this technology advantage, I think there's going to be a lot of value there. And so for us, those are kind of the two focus areas right now. Um, and, you know, in addition to that, I would say also gene therapies as well. Like there's a whole new 
class of gene therapies coming out. And we're gonna have to find ways to make that affordable, measure the outcomes and, and everything that goes with that as well. So, you know, at a high level, you know, I, I think it's a, it's a time to be optimistic. There's a lot of new innovation coming to market. And what we have to do as we make this generational shift to value is how do we make those innovations actually work for individuals? How do we make those affordable? Right. How do we make them accessible? And how do we make the math work for us as a country? Well, I very much look forward to the day when everyone has access to the therapeutic assistance that they need for PTSD, where our uh, elders can age in place as desired and uh, where all of these, this, this transition to value-based care has come into fruition. I think there's a lot of very interesting space for growth there. So I, I look forward to seeing how your companies play out. And I'm very excited to have you at Future Interview this year. So thanks so much for Great. joining us. Great. Thank you.